Hey everybody, welcome back to FRM 120. We're going to move out of our electrical phase, uh, no pun intended. Uh, we're going to move out from the electrical side of this class and we're going to focus more on the fluid power uh, aspect of it, specifically the pneumatics. Uh, and we're not going to make you fluid power specialists. Like I said, I'm going to teach you what you need to know uh, and no more and no less, okay? So we're not going to dive super deep into the science. Uh, we could uh, if you were going into a different field. But for what you're going to be doing in breweries, uh, we're going to just uh, get you to the level that, that you have an understanding of what's going on as far as pneumatics uh, in the brewing operation, uh, mostly in the packaging and things like that. So we're going to kind of move uh, at that level, at that pace, but we're going to start uh, talking about pneumatics first. Okay, and basically pneumatics is the transfer of energy through a gas, okay? And we use several gases in the brewing operation. First of all, we use compressed air for different things, such as uh, cylinders to move things. Uh, uh, you know, not so much um, in the actual beer making processes or the beer making itself. Uh, like we do everything we can to keep air out of beer uh, once it's been uh, once it's put, been put in fermenters. But we do use air on, on uh, several uh, different uh, applications. We use nitrogen for um, nitro for in some certain beers or nitro using uh, compressed nitrogen. Uh, CO2, uh, we carbonate with CO2 uh, and uh, pressurize that with that pressurized gas. And also with oxygen, we uh, oxygenate our uh, work as we put it into the uh, fermenter and right before we put our yeast in it, we use oxygen uh, in, in, uh, to, to try to, to uh, make a more healthy environment for our yeast to do their work, okay? Um, and it's also, pneumatics are used extensively in the food processing uh, industry. Uh, they have very fast actuation. Uh, the cylinders move much quicker than they do with uh, hydraulics, okay? There are some, there, uh, the fast actuation is one of the advantages. There are some drawbacks. Uh, but they're, one of them being is they're not as strong as hydraulics, okay? And hydraulics cannot be used uh, anywhere food is going to be used. Okay, uh, I used to work in a feed mill years and years ago uh, as a maintenance supervisor there, and everything that we uh, that we did to move the uh, feed or the ingredients or whatever it was along the line to process, uh, it was used with pneumatics because should you have a hydraulic leak, uh, the smallest leak of hydraulic fluid into the um, into the feed, the mixed feed before it's processed, uh, then that winds up in the animals. It's a liability; it could kill the animals. Um, and you know it's just a, a big mess there so uh, we use pneumatics as a result of that but like I said hydraulics should never be really used in the food processing industry or anything around food grade substance uh, that includes beer okay because you certainly don't want to drink a hydraulic fluid all right so um, like I said it's very fast actuation and it's also uh, you know uh, very safe as far as contamination things like that very, and uh, we use those uh, here's uh, a little uh, file here. We're running here. Just some, all this process is just putting some glue. This is not beer related, but this is uh, putting some glue down on a part, and all these all the pneumatic symbols. I mean, excuse me, cylinders and actuators that are at play. And they're very fast, a lot faster, a lot cleaner. Uh, but it's just a little uh, illustration there. A uh, couple of fundamentals about pneumatics. It, re it relies on flow. Okay. Now a lot of people think, well, you got to have pressure. Well. Now, what we, what we are wanting to do is to move that gas, and for the most part, we're going to be talking about compressed air, okay? Um, but we want to move that gas, okay? It's one thing uh, the, the, to, to have pressure, okay? But when you have pressure, that means you've either got a restriction or flow, or, or flow or no flow at all. So that really does us no good. So once you get you in your head about what we're, not, what we're not trying to do is create pressure in a line, we're trying to create flow. Now you do use pressure behind the flow to keep to move it at certain rates, but we are, we are looking at flow as far as our pneumatic. So it's just a little fundamental thing when you get your head around. Um, like I said, the pressure forces the flow. Um, it's also shapeless, okay? Um, unlike hydraulics, it, uh, you know, it just goes everywhere uh, in terms of the molecules. And you're gonna see something here about that in just a second. Um, and it takes the shape of the vessel in which it's confined, uh, and it seeks to move from a higher pressure down to a lower pressure. In other words, you've probably heard it put this way, um, it uh, seeks to, to find the path of re least resistance, okay? 
So if you've got something that's very high pressure in a vessel, it's contained in there and it's wanting to get out. Okay, the reason it wants to get out is it wants to move out to a uh, to a less restricted, less confined area. Okay, so it's the path of least restriction, and it's going to uh, go out into a lower pressure. So it's always seeking a lower pressure. Okay. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about pressures, atmospheric pressures, and things like that. But these are some principles right here you're going to want to kind of uh, keep in the forefront of your mind as we're going through this. But we're always seeking to go from high pressure down to low pressure. Uh, prime example, let's take, let's take the tires on your vehicle, okay? Um, you've got a little valve stem that lets air in or out, okay? So uh, if I press the valve stem on a fully inflated tire, okay, uh, it's going to have, let's just, just say, 30 pounds of pressure. Okay, and the atmospheric pressure is lower than that. So it's going to seek to leave that tire and come out in the atmosphere, out in the atmosphere because that pressure in the atmosphere is lower than what's in the tire. Vice versa, if you have a flat tire with no, uh, no gauge pressure on it at all, okay, and you, put, you, you take the compressed air from your air compressor, your tank or whatever, and you're putting it in there, the air in that compressed tank is seeking um, to go to uh, a, a path of least resistance. Okay, so it's going to go into that tire and it's going to inflate, start inflating the tire until the two match, okay, until, until, or the compressed air takes over. And then, um, so my point is, is that it is trying to find its, its path of least resistance. It's going to seek a higher pressure. It's going to seek a lower pressure, okay? So just keep that in mind as we go forward. And again, what you're seeing here is unlike uh, hydraulic uh, molecules that move through there, these are these are kind of the pathways or sort of the motions that um, that uh, uh, air will take, that the molecules of air will take. They're known as moving around in a chaotic manner. That is a fish. That really is a term. It's chaotic. Um, and I'm not just using that to describe it, even though it does look like chaos. It kind of is. But air and gas molecules move in a chaotic manner. Okay, they're always in motion too. Um, and this is uh, the reason they're always in motion and the, they move this way is due to their weak molecular bond. In other words, they do not bind to each other like a hydraulic, uh, uh, like a molecule uh, of hydraulic fluid, okay, two, two molecules of hydraulic fluid, okay? So you've got, they, they will bind, they have a molecular bond, a stronger bond than, than the pneumatic ones do, okay? So if you were able to see these molecules under a microscope, you'd see this is how they would move. If, if you see them and uh, this is how they move about whereas the liquids would stay uh, particularly when they're not under pressure when they would not be moving at all okay so this like I said some more basic principles um, and one thing about and this is the biggest difference this is why I put this on here by itself the biggest difference between um, hydraulics and pneumatics is that air is compressible and fluid is not Okay, now we can put pressure behind a fluid and make it very, very strong, very, very forceful, okay? Um, but you're not compressing that fluid. You're moving that fluid. The only thing, if we were to put air behind uh, a body of hydraulic fluid here, we would be compressing this air until finally we were able to move that hydraulic fluid. But the hydraulic fluid will stay in, a, in its, um, it will not compress. That's one of the great advantages of hydraulics. You look at, at um, large equipment, uh, they use hydraulics. Uh, you look at the lifts in your garage, uh, in your service garage that you take your car to, and they'll put it up on a big lift with a big cylinder in the middle of the floor um, sometimes. And the reason they do that is because it's hydraulics, it lifts it up, and it's very strong. It can, it can hold the weight of a car or a truck. Whereas, you usually, something, usually something over 100 pounds um, is, is, is about the limit you can get on pure 100% pneumatics. Now you can have air over hydraulics, that's a whole area we're not going to go into uh, that makes a stronger lift system or something like that, but my point is, is that air is compressible whereas fluid is not, okay? And that's the, that's the, two, the difference between the two, okay? Now, <clears throat> we're talking about pressure here. I want to go into a little bit of the science behind it, but not a lot. Uh, this, the pressure is the measure of force uh, per uh, unit uh, area, okay, per unit area, all right? So if we have a certain area with pressure, with a, a certain volume of area, and we start to press down on there, and we start to decrease the volume, we're going to increase our pressure. So if the pressure increases, the more force 
uh, that you that, that you're forcing these molecules together. Okay, so you got these molecules here in this X, get this volume of space right here. Okay, and they're free to move around a lot more in this particular vessel than here, where we've where we've uh, kind of taken this uh, piston and really compressed it. They don't have as much movement. They start moving faster, and then they start moving, and it's and that that. Um, that movement starts to generate heat, okay? So if you were able to take a, a, a thermography camera or, or a laser uh, temperature probe or something and see this amount of activity going through here, this temperature would not be as great as this because we start to decrease the volume at the area that they are confined in. We start to increase their pressure. They've got not as much room to move around and not as much room to be chaotic in, okay? And they start to, uh, they start to for lack of better ways of seeing it, bump into each other a little more frequently, and then that starts to generate heat. So, again, a couple of points here with pressure is the measure of force per unit area. This is our unit area here. This is another unit of area right here. And it increases, the pressure increases the more you force the gas molecules together, okay? All right, so we're talking about pressure and how is it measured? Okay, what, is, what does pressure mean? We throw this around a lot uh, with as far as like, PSI, pounds per square inch, and things like that. What does that mean? You go to surface station. I need 30 PSI in this town, in this tire. So what does that mean exactly? Well, first of all, <clears throat> we got to look about about the the, the uh, atmospheric pressure. Okay, and atmospheric pressure that is the pressure in the atmosphere on a, on a perfect day uh, is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, Mike, what in the world does that mean? Where does that come from? Okay. So picture this with me, if you will. This is this is the amount of, of um, this is the weight of the air. Should uh, if we if we were able to measure it from here to the top of my of the atmosphere, okay, that would be the weight in a, in a in a particular column between sea level and the top of the atmosphere. I'm going to take that just a little bit step further, okay. Let's suppose, and because we're talking about uh, square inches, okay, that's literally one inch squares, okay. All right. So visualize this, visualize this, if you will, with me. Okay, we've got these one-inch squares. Okay, and I'm standing here at sea level. Okay, I'm somewhere on, the, you know, kind of near, near to the coast at sea level, and um, I've got these one-inch squares in my hand. Okay, and I start stacking them all the way to the top of our to, to our atmosphere. Okay, the weight that I would be carrying would be 14.7 pounds. I would. That, that's how much you weight. I would be holding in my hands, okay? That's how much pressure that the atmosphere is putting down on Earth uh, <clears throat> you know, through, through, through pressure, okay? So that's gonna be the weight that I'm gonna be carrying around. So, and it stands to reason that if we move from sea level to say somewhere in Colorado or some other elevation much higher, okay? Um, if, we, if we go, then, then it's gonna be less columns, and less little square boxes in my hands from that point to the atmosphere. So our atmospheric pressure lessens with, how, with altitude, just to give you some relevance there, okay? Uh, but like I said, um, at, at sea level, it's 14.7. If, like I said, if we go to Colorado or the Himalayas or somewhere very, very high, uh, it's gonna be less because there is less space between um, that point and the atmosphere. So it's gonna be less, you hold less little square cubes in your hand, so the fewer that you hold, the less weight or pressure uh, that you'd be holding, okay? That's just kind of a, I try to use little graphics like that uh, to, to explain things, but this is like the topography here in the mountains and the sea level and everything to kind of explain that. But anyway, so we're not gonna measure things by the number of square cubes we can hold our hand to the atmosphere, a little, just a little bit impractical. So uh, how is pressure measured? Okay, well we use gauges, all right? Now, um, any pressure above gauge pressure uh, in a contained system is we know we know that as gauge pressure okay so I've got an air tank okay and my gauge on my air tank reads zero okay I've gotten we say I've got no air in it okay um, that's not exactly true because you still have air in there it's not a vacuum it's just sitting there and it is equalized with the atmospheric pressure therefore the pressure inside the tank is 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure, okay? However, our gauge that's, that's usually hanging on the side of that air tank or the side of your air compressor that's empty, okay, that's flat, okay, the gauge is gonna read zero. 
and that is gauge pressure. So gauge pressure compensates for 14.7 pounds, okay? It, it says, yeah, 14.7 pounds for atmospheric pressure, uh, but we're gonna start at zero. We're gonna take that point, and then we're gonna, we're gonna kind of calibrate it to zero, so that if we have, uh, if we take one pound of pressure and increase it inside of our air tank, I'm just using air tank as an example, if we have uh, one pound of pressure, we add one pound of pressure into our tank, we've actually got 15.7 pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure, okay? It's atmospheric plus one, and then our gauge would read one pound, but that's taken in, that's taken in consideration the atmospheric pressure. So that's gauge pressure. So when you see, so just a little, you know, next time you are out and about and you check the air uh, pressure, uh, or if you look at a gauge or something that's measuring uh, system pressure in a, in a canning system or something like that, know that if you're reading, say, 20 uh, pounds per pressure, it's gonna read, it's, you're actually measuring 34.7. Just a little fun fact for you there. But as I said, it's annotated in PSIG, uh, the G being the gauge, okay? Um, and like I said, this is we, we've covered this already, but just some more uh, uh, notes for you right there on how pressure is actually measured. Okay, now how is pressure, com uh, how is uh, compressed air uh, created? Okay, well we use compressors. Okay, and there are a couple of different kinds. Probably the one that most everyone is familiar with is the reciprocating type. It's very much like a, the, a gasoline engine that you might see on your lawnmower. Okay, it's got valves that allow intake of air, then we have a piston that compresses that air, and then we let the air out of our outlet valve into our system to power our cylinders, um, our, our uh, any actuators that we have, whatever, you know, if you have to have uh, compressed air to blow something off, whatever the case may be. We use a compressor, like I said, very much like a, a gasoline engine for those of you who have ever seen the inside of a, say, a lawnmower engine, for example, We've got a single cylinder with a single piston on this one. We have a valve that allows air to come in. And then as we stated earlier in a few slides back, we compress that air. Now, if you, this were a liquid and this thing tried to compress the liquid and the valves were closed where it couldn't go anywhere at this time because we wait to compress that air before we allow it to escape the cylinder. But if this were full of liquid, it would lock it up, you would bend this rod Old aircraft engines used to have a problem with the cylinders and the radial engines on the bottom of the engines. Um, the oil would collect down there, and if you weren't careful, careful, they had to take the spark plugs out, spin it through to drain that oil out. Otherwise, it would be it would do what was known as hydraulicing, and it would try to compress that oil. Oil is a is a liquid; it's not going to compress, and it would compress it, and it would bend a rod. So there's a little bit more of your life that you won't get back. But I'm just trying to make a point here that we compress the air uh, to the point where uh, it's, the volume is, is decreasing. Now, something else that's going on here is the temperature of the air coming in here is much lower. Let's say it's 80 degrees outside. I don't, I don't have a, a, a you know, exact reading or anything, but the air exiting out is much hotter. In fact, if you ever carefully uh, can access the, uh, the uh, exhaust pipe or the uh, Air, air pipe out to your system, this just usually gets very hot, okay? But that's because we are compressing those air molecules, we're making them tighter and tighter, they have less and less place to run to, to move around in their chaotic form, and therefore they start to generate additional heat over and over and over with each cycle, then, and then the piston and the cylinder start to heat up, everything starts to get warm, it kind of, kind of builds on each other. So uh, my point is, is that we compress that air, we create heat, but this is one way that we compress it. And we use electric motor with a belt to spin a pulley. This pulley uh, spins the uh, crankshaft here, and then of course it goes up and down like you're seeing here in this graphic. But this is the most common way of compressing air. Most of you have some of these at your homes. Um, another way is just a, it's just a little bit bigger graphic, uh, in case you could see it on the camera. It's doing the exact same thing, okay? But uh, another way to compress air is through a screw conveyor. Now these are uh, got, got some great advantages. Um, they're much more quiet. Okay, they don't have that back and forth reciprocating jerking motion. So they don't wear they don't, their wear components. Uh, they don't they don't wear nearly as much. Uh, they're much more expensive because these are like helical screws that are kind of joined, like my fingers are here. Okay, they move inside of each other, and what they do is they take air 
trap it in between these um, in between these kind of helical gear uh, points here and compress it tighter and tighter and tighter it gets you know the further it goes through these screws the more and more it compresses it a lot like a jet engine does but it compresses it till finally it exit out and even the blue and red graphics show you that it's coming in kind of cold and as it compresses and those molecules are compressed they generate more heat and as you can see the air coming out of the compressor is much hotter as, as depicted by this red stream of air coming out and typically you'll cool that air off before you send it into your system to operate whatever it is you, you operate but <clears throat> these are much more expensive but they're much more reliable um, and a lot less maintenance, a lot less herky-jerky, back and forth reciprocating, banging and clanging uh, like a, a reciprocating uh, uh, compressor is. Uh, but anyway, that's the that's second way we do that is to uh, use a screw compressor. Uh, we've got a couple of these in the uh, downstairs that, that service air throughout our building here, um, run off of BFD, okay, we've talked about those. So um, they start up very slowly, ramp up nice and smooth, uh, no, no slamming or anything like that and everything. And these compressors will last a lot longer, but they are much more expensive too. So uh, another bigger shot of that for, in case you can see it. All right. Okay. So as I always like to do, I like to break these down into smaller chunks. So uh, for right now, we're going to uh, kind of just give you just super fundamental uh, idea of what compressed air is and how we make it. And then, now we're going to move uh, into our next lecture and we're going to talk about using the compressed air and the functions and the different components that you'll see when you are working in, in the brewery. Okay, So for right now, uh, we'll just kind of shut it down. Be sure to come back because you don't want to miss this next exhilarating lecture on pneumatics. Okay, uh, Just kidding. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you in a few minutes.